Oh, do you know the Muffin Man, the Muffin Man, the Muffin Man? Do you know the Muffin Man? His name is Ben Starr and he's the ultimate food geek. Okay, clearly that is why I am a chef and not a singer, folks. But welcome to my channel. I'm Ben Starr, the ultimate food geek. We have got a really interesting episode today where I am going to teach you the easiest and fastest way to produce sourdough English muffins. Now we've got two rules on my channel and the first is we always use a scale because you cannot ensure consistent results in sourdough baking, especially if you're a newbie without a scale. So if you don't have a scale, first thing to do is order yourself a scale. My favorite one is in the video description. Just click where it says more underneath this video to find out my favorite, but any scale will do. The second rule on my channel is we watch the entire video. We don't skip ahead over the geeky stuff. When you skip ahead over the geeky stuff on my channel, not only does it make you fractionally stupider, some billionaire out there requires an even larger chunk of Hawaii. So settle down and let's learn a little bit about English muffins and their history. Because why would you want to bake English muffins if you can't fascinate and entertain your friends and family with all of your vast knowledge about the history of English muffins, right? On my channel, you typically either get a lot of science about why something is happening or a lot of interesting history, culture, and anthropology behind a recipe. Now, when you bake a recipe like English muffins that has a storied tradition, you are participating in something relatively profound. And if you are privy to that information, each time you bake them, it will be more meaningful to you and thus the folks that you were baking for. So before we get into the nuts and bolts of how to make simple sourdough English muffins, we need to learn a little bit about what an English muffin is because this is an English muffin, but this is a muffin a sourdough oatmeal cinnamon apple muffin to be sure, and a relatively healthy and delicious one at that. But still, muffin, muffin, these two things don't look anything alike. But it turns out that this is what Americans think of as a muffin, and this is what folks in the northern part of the UK think of as a muffin. And they've been making them for way longer than we have. English muffins basically came about here in the United States in the late 1800s. And there are a couple of warring stories about how they actually originated and became famous. Now we know for a fact that a British man named Samuel Thomas had a bakery in New York City in the 1880s. And his bakery was quite famous for producing something that he called toaster crumpets. Now, if you're an American, probably the only time you've ever heard of a crumpet is by reading British literature, right? Jane Austen, Charles Dickens, tea and crumpets. Crumpets are still popular to this day all across the British Commonwealth. And they might in fact look a little bit familiar to you. Turn them around and you'll see that on the English muffin, one side looks pretty much like the other, but the other side of a crumpet might give some of you a little bit of a panic attack because it's filled with those creepy little holes. Now, crumpets are designed with these nooks and crannies on the top to gather the butter and the jam as you smear them across. So the origin of the American style English muffin definitely results from the British crumpet, which is essentially a thick pancake that is griddle cooked inside of a ring to hold the batter in. And 90% of the cooking time is only on one side of, so all of the bubbles rise to the top and break and the batter sets before it's finished for just a few seconds on the opposite side. The American English muffin is flipped and cooked on the opposite side before the batter has a chance to set, which gives you a solid surface on each side of the muffin. And as early as 1910, there was already a commercial bakery in Kansas City producing these English muffins, the Wolferman Bakery, which proudly stated that their English muffins were cooked in tuna cans. They just found a creative way to repurpose what would otherwise be a waste product into a functional baking ring for them that would allow them to cook their English muffins. I'm pretty sure they washed the tuna cans first. But as commercial bakeries began to expand and the demand for producing muffins increased, they discovered that cooking each individual English muffin inside of a ring became a little bit laborious. It couldn't as easily be automated. So Samuel Thomas in New York decided to rework the recipe entirely, make a dough, cut it out like biscuits, and cook it on the griddle on both sides because that could be automated and cooked much, much faster than the traditional ring method. And from that point on, that's where we got this stuff, you guys. It still carries Samuel Thomas's name, although the massive bakery conglomerate Bimbo now owns the recipe and produces all of these. It still carries his original name and it is still produced in that way. But it's not necessarily particularly authentic to the original inspiration, the crumpet, which is a high hydration batter like a pancake, as opposed to a thicker, kneadable, cuttable dough that Thomas English muffins are made from. So of course, in the spirit of respecting tradition, but making things as simple as possible and eliminating the stuff that doesn't need to be done, 
I have come up with a simple sourdough recipe that will allow you to create delicious homemade English muffins at home that will blow the pants off of this crap. I'm gonna be honest, I think store-bought English muffins are disgusting. The only thing that makes these edible, in my opinion, is toasting them with a lot of butter and then smearing on enough delicious stuff on top of it that you can't taste the muffin anymore. My sourdough English muffin recipe, as you might expect, is infinitely more flavorful than the cardboard stuff you get at the grocery store. And we already know that's gonna be the case because we're making it with sourdough starter, right? Now, we already know that any type of sourdough bread product is going to have naturally more flavor than its commercial yeast produced counterpart, right? But you can also buy sourdough English muffins. But guess what, folks? It's fake. Let's take a look at the ingredients list, shall we? Enriched wheat flour, water, yeast, rice flour, salt, cornmeal, sugar, soybean oil, wheat starch, monoglycerides, acetic acid, citric acid, soy, and whey. So folks, like every single thing you find on the supermarket shelf that is labeled sourdough, it is made with commercial yeast and they add citric acid or vinegar to it to make it tart. So in case you find that these sourdough English muffins are not as tart as you would like, or my regular simple sourdough recipes are not as tart as you like, maybe that's because you're expecting sourdough to be tart because you're eating fake tart sourdough from the grocery store. If you keep your starter in the fridge, your resulting sourdough products are not going to be particularly tart. So let's learn to love our homemade sourdough for the flavor that our beloved natural starter produces naturally and not try to chase that tart flavor because you know what? That's largely fake. All right, to mix up our batter, we start with, of course, sourdough starter. Mine is at 100% hydration. If yours is more or less than that, it's not gonna make as huge a difference in this recipe as it will in most of my recipes. We are adding two ounces of sourdough starter. For you metric folks, the conversions are right there on the screen. Also, as with all of my YouTube videos, the entire recipe is written out with extra notes to help you guys out in the video description directly below the video. Just click where it says more and you'll find both the American Standard and metric conversions for the recipe right there. Two ounces of sourdough starter. It can be super active having recently been fed or it can be super old and sleepy right out of the fridge with absolutely no feedings. Of course, the longer it's been since your starter has eaten, the more flavor you will get in your resulting muffins. Remember the rule of thumb, the longer it sits, the more flavor you get. All right, to this starter, we are going to add six ounces of water. This is also the same as six fluid ounces of water because the fluid ounce is a volumetric measurement designed on the weight of one ounce of water. Next, buttermilk. And if you don't have buttermilk in your refrigerator, shame on you. You've probably learned from my other videos that you must have buttermilk in your fridge. And no, you cannot make buttermilk by adding a little bit of lemon juice or vinegar to milk. That does not make buttermilk. Buttermilk makes buttermilk. I have a very important video on buttermilk and why it's an important ingredient that always needs to be in your fridge and it's not as high maintenance as you think and lasts way beyond the expiration date. Just watch the video and you will thank me later. Now, if you live in a country where buttermilk is not common, buttermilk is there, it's just not called buttermilk. This is simply a fermented dairy liquid. So whatever your soured milk product is, sour cream, creme fraiche, a variety of different yogurts, kefir, check the video description and I'll give you everything you need to know about substituting for buttermilk milk if you cannot find buttermilk. And you can also make it yourself at home with practically no effort, which is what this is, it's homemade. All right, six ounces of buttermilk. And two tablespoons or one ounce of unsalted butter melted. I melt mine in the microwave at half power so it doesn't explode everywhere. And now we wanna whisk these ingredients together. You can use a regular whisk for this step, but eventually once we add flour, the regular whisk is not gonna be super effective. So if you're a gadget person like me and you do a lot of baking, you probably wanna get yourself what's called a bratpisker or a Danish bread whisk. Bratpisker is Danish for a whisker for bread. This is great for blending everything from thin batters to thicker batters all the way up to doughs. So I'm gonna get in there and break up my sourdough starter and get it mixed thoroughly into our liquid ingredients. And now we're gonna add 10 ounces of all-purpose flour. You can use bread flour if you don't keep all-purpose flour around, but for English muffins, I prefer the final texture when it's made with a lower protein all-purpose flour to bread flour. Now we're gonna add about a teaspoon of kosher salt. If you're using fine salt, like Celtic salt or Himalayan salt, you can use half a teaspoon. 
I don't measure mine by weight for this recipe. And then one teaspoon of double acting baking powder. Now virtually all baking powder sold in this modern era is double acting. That means it has a chemical leavening, it's got a powdered acid and a powdered alkaline that mix together and immediately produce some carbon dioxide gas. But it also has a second stage where when it's heated, it produces another round of carbon dioxide gas and that is what we're after. And if you're wondering why we're adding baking powder to a sourdough product, well, English muffins are famous for their nooks and crannies. And baking powder produces a different type of carbon dioxide leavening, which produces a different size and shape of bubble once the batter gets heated. So we're adding this to basically mimic those nooks and crannies that English muffins became famous for. Personally, I'm quite bothered by those two words and I don't really want to eat a cranny, but um, it is what it is. So we're going to add one teaspoon of baking powder, double acting, and not baking soda. You cannot substitute baking soda for baking powder. Baking soda is a chemical leavening agent that immediately reacts with acid, and our sourdough starter and our buttermilk are both acidic. So if you use baking soda, all that CO2 is gonna be produced immediately, and tomorrow, when we're ready to cook our English muffins, the baking soda reaction will be completely done and we won't get anything out of it. All right, now we are going to stir this. The nice thing about Bratfiskers is that they make the stirring process a lot more efficient. So it actually takes you less time to get everything homogenous than it would if you were using a fork or a spoon or a spatula. That's especially nice when you're making quick breads that do not rely on gluten development in order to rise. In fact, we actively do not want a lot of gluten development in things like pancakes and biscuits and cookies because then the resulting product will be tough when it's baked because the gluten was overdeveloped. In this case, we actually do want the gluten developed, but that's going to happen automatically over the fermentation period. So now we're going to cover our batter with a lid, some plastic wrap, a plate, a baking sheet, something like that, and leave it on the counter at room temperature for at least 12 hours or up to 24 hours. Now if your starter is super sleepy and you haven't fed it in two months, you probably want to air closer to the 24 hour mark. If your batter does double in 12 hours, you can still wait 24 hours to cook your English muffins. The more it sits, the more flavor you get. Now, as I mentioned, I have reverse engineered this recipe from the English Crumpet, which is a high hydration batter. And that is indeed how virtually all English muffins were made in the United States until Samuel Thomas patented his, oh, I made a stiff dough and cut it out in a circle like a biscuit and cooked it on a griddle, instead of pouring a batter into a ring and cooking it on a griddle the old fashioned way. A higher hydration dough means a more delicate finished product. It's softer and more yielding. And I'm gonna be honest, that's always been my big problem with English muffins, that they're, they're kind of rubbery and sort of waxy textured. I don't like it at all. So my recipe yields a tender, delicious, moist interior crumb to the English muffin while still having all of those nooks and crannies that I don't like to talk about. But this means that you are going to need some rings to cook your English muffins in. I have these multi-purpose kitchen rings that I got on Amazon, link is below, and they work for everything. I use them as ring molds to plate beautiful little circles of ingredients with at the restaurant. They can also be used to cook an egg to the perfect exact size of your homemade English muffins so that you can make your own perfectly uniform egg McMuffins at home if you want to. They're not expensive, they're stainless steel so they work in the dishwasher. For me, it's worth the few bucks to get them. Also, I have like eight of them so I can make eight muffins at a time on my griddle. But if you don't want to purchase something purpose-built, you can do what the Wolfermans did and repurpose something that you would ordinarily throw into the recycling bin or the trash. And the Wolfermans used tuna cans. Now, in the last 20 years, I actually haven't seen a single tuna can that you can cut open from both sides, right? They only have one openable side. But I did find at my grocery store recently that the pineapple cans can actually be opened on the top and the bottom, those skinnier, small pineapple cans. And so those are the ones that I would recommend. Those also happen to be acid resistant because pineapple is acidic, so they will last longer for you. If you are going the repurposing a commercial can route, I definitely recommend that you use a side open can opener. This is not the kind that has the little wheel that cuts down into the top and leaves you with a sharp edge. This one cuts around the edge of the can sideways, and these leave a safe edge that you're not likely to cut yourself on quite as much. You also wanna give a little bit of a thought to the size of ring that you're after if the size of your English muffin is important to you. These are about three inch rings and they are multi-purpose in my kitchen. I use them for a variety of things. So this is the only size of English muffin that I can produce. For scaling purposes, a regular English muffin from the grocery store is about four inches in diameter, a little bit larger than my three inch ring mold. You go with whatever you can get your hands on. 
Second piece of specialty equipment is something you probably already have in your kitchen or the equivalent of it, which is a griddle. I am gonna be using this plug-in electric griddle and I like it because it gives me very precise, consistent temperature control and temperature precision is everything when getting a perfect cook on English muffins. I can set my dial on my thermostat and forget about it and that griddle is gonna remain basically that temperature throughout the entire cooking period. That's why I like it. I'm actually a huge fan of this exact model of plug-in griddle because it's slimline, right? It doesn't take up a huge amount of space in my cabinets and it doesn't have these giant ridiculous handles off the side so it is super space efficient. I'll link to this model in the video description if you happen to want to get mine. Failing an electric griddle, you can use a stovetop griddle that sits on top of your burners. This one is cast iron, it's double-sided, and I use it quite a bit when I'm looking for really high temperature searing. It straddles two burners. The other type of stovetop griddle is quite a bit lighter weight. They are non-stick griddles. They're usually made of a combination of aluminum and other metals. And the quick responsiveness of aluminum on the stovetop is both a blessing and a curse. It'll respond quickly if you need to get your temperature down or up, but because it's got less thermal mass, it doesn't moderate the heat and sort of average it out. So for me, I tend to prefer the cast iron griddles over the lighter weight nonstick griddles, and it only costs just a few dollars more. If you aren't currently using a griddle, whether it's an electric or a stovetop griddle, and you'll be new to this sort of griddling process, there is one more thing that will make a world of difference in this recipe and in general, and that is a no contact infrared thermometer. These are actually way cheaper than they used to be. You can now get them for 15 or 20 bucks, and they tell you what the exact temperature is on your cooking surface. For this recipe, we're aiming for a temperature between 350 and 375 degrees Fahrenheit on our surface. Any more than that, and we will risk burning our English muffins. Any less than that, and it's gonna take them forever to cook, and we may not get that beautiful, lovely brown crust on them. So if you wanna splurge for one of these, you're gonna end up with perfect English muffins from the very first one you cook. Otherwise, it might take you two or three muffins until you get your temperature and your timing down. But it's absolutely not necessary. Our grandmothers never cooked with this when they made pancakes or English English muffins from scratch. I'll show you a little trick that'll kind of give you an idea if your griddle is in the right temperature range here in just a bit. And if you don't have a griddle and don't want to get yourself one, a pan. Works just fine, tried and true, old-fashioned, cast iron preferably, but non-stick aluminum will work. You just won't be able to make quite as many muffins at a time. And if this is your first time doing it, you're only gonna wanna cook one or two muffins at a time until you get the hang of it. But for me, I can cook eight of them at a time and churn this recipe out super fast. It has been 23 hours since I mixed up my batter. And as you can see, the batter has more than doubled in volume. Now this actually happened at around the 12, 13 hour mark. So I could have baked these back then, but I decided to just wait because this was a more convenient time for me to bake. I have preheated my electric griddle and folks, if your electric griddle has a thermostat on it, the thermostats lie. I have got my thermostat set on just about 310 degrees, but my actual cooking surface is 378 degrees. Not only are the griddle thermostats just wildly inaccurate to begin with, the griddle is going to overstep the threshold that you set it at because as soon as food hits the surface of this griddle, the temperature is going to tank and it does not want it to tank so low that it has trouble catching back up to maintain the temperature that you want it set at. So it's perfectly fine if the surface of your griddle measures up to 380, 390 or even 400 degrees because as soon as you put food on it, it's gonna cool down. Really, we want our cooking surface to maintain a temperature of around 350 or so degrees as the English muffins are cooking. So if your starting temperature is around 375 or 380, that's really ideal. The old fashioned way to determine whether the griddle's at proper temperature is to drop a few drops of water onto the surface of the griddle. And if those little water droplets dance around a bit before they finally evaporate, you're good to go. If they evaporate instantly like that, your griddle is too hot. If they sit there and just kind of like bubble, your griddle is too cold. So drop some drops of water on there, see if they dance around a little bit and get smaller until they go away completely, and then you know you're good to go. Now I'm gonna do these one at a time for demonstration purposes, but the more comfortable you get with this recipe, you can churn out as many at a time as you have rings. So our griddle is hot and ready to go and things are gonna move pretty quickly from here on out. Now I'm gonna cook one of these at a time so that I can really focus on details and teach you guys how to make these properly. First thing that we need to do is grease our ring and we can either do that by rubbing some soft or melted butter on the inside, any kind of oil, avocado oil, olive oil. I'm actually spraying mine 
I know some of you have an absolute conniption when I do this. And then we need to grease our griddle. We can do that with the exact same oil or for better flavor, we can use butter. Ring goes down onto the griddle. And then we are going to add about one fourth cup of our batter. I am using a number 20 ice cream scoop, which has a capacity of two fluid ounces or one fourth of a cup. If you don't have an ice cream scoop, which just makes it really handy and keeps your hands from getting all sticky, you can of course use a one fourth cup measuring cup to get in there, scoop it out with your finger and dump it in there. Now, if for some reason your batter all went onto one side of that circle, you jiggle that circle around a little bit just to make sure it's repositioned properly. And now we're gonna let the muffin cook for four minutes. During that time, we're gonna get a nice golden crust developing on the bottom and the muffin will cook about halfway through. After four minutes, it's time to flip and I really like to use these kitchen gloves for protection because these rings are super hot. So I slide my spatula underneath and give it just a quick flip. And then you'll usually have to tap the muffin down just a little bit to make sure it is sort of evenly in contact with the griddle's cooking surface so that you get an even cook on the second side. Now, four more minutes. If you have a probe thermometer, you can actually monitor the internal temperature of the muffin as it's baking. And we're shooting for an internal temp in the center of that muffin for 195 Fahrenheit or higher. Also be careful as you're pushing your probe down into the muffin that you don't go almost all the way down toward the cooking surface because that's not gonna give you an accurate reading. You wanna only go down about halfway into the muffin itself to get its internal temp. And right now we are looking at 195 degrees exactly. So for us, four minutes and four minutes was correct. But you may have to tweak the times and temperature of your skillet just a little bit to get it exactly where you need it to be for that muffin to be done. So I'm gonna go ahead and pull off the ring and get our muffin out onto a cooling rack. And we're gonna do the next one. I'm gonna film this one up close so you can really get a good look at what's happening here. First things first, clean off the surface of your griddle between baking rounds just to make sure you don't have any overly browned oils or butter on the surface that might discolor your muffins or make them taste bad. Now we oil the ring. Get some butter on the griddle. Ring goes down. Fourth cup of batter. All right, four minutes. It's time to do the flip. Now I like to run this over and gather up that extra cooking butter because that makes those extra delicious. Four more minutes. All right, now we're gonna take our temperature. 199, all right, so we are good. Ring comes off. And we move that to our cooling rack. Now this recipe yields eight three inch English muffins. If you're using rings that are a little bit larger, of course your yield is gonna be a little bit lower because you're gonna to have to add a little bit more than a fourth of a cup of batter for a four inch ring or anything larger than three inches. Now, of course you can make thicker muffins like this one by adding more batter into the ring, but that is also going to correspondingly increase your cooking time. And if you notice that your tops and bottoms are getting too dark brown with that, lower your griddle temperature just a little bit to accommodate for the extra cooking time. Once you've done the recipe a couple of times, you'll understand your scaling as well as how many you can handle at a time. At that point, feel free to scale the recipe up if you wanna make a whole bunch at one time. They freeze quite beautifully. Now, you must let your English muffins cool absolutely completely before you can successfully open them. The texture of the crumb really needs to set for a little while in order for it to be properly English. So I've had one of these staling in the refrigerator for about an hour, and I'm gonna show you how to properly open it. And I assume if you're on this video, it's because you like English muffins, you already know how to properly open an English muffin, but you do not do it with a knife. If you slice an English muffin open with a knife, all you're doing is collapsing those nooks and crannies. Ooh, I hate that word. I don't wanna eat a cranny. So you take a fork and you shove it into the center of the muffin from along the edge, all the way to about the center, and then you just go all the way around. There we have the nooks and 
crannies that are made famous by the English muffin. Now, when we compare this to the original Thomas English muffin, you'll see we have some really large air bubbles up here, but I mean, can't spread any melted butter on that. On this side of the muffin, our texture is quite remarkably similar. Now we're gonna compare it to the major national brand competitor, which claims to be sourdough, but we know is actually not sourdough, it's fake sourdough. And there's actually a, I mean, this is a really open crumb structure, but there's something about that that does not look appealing to me at all. And we also know that it was made with commercial yeast that just had some acids added to the recipe, so we already know this is an imposter. Our room temperature taste test at this point would be completely unfair because although our homemade English muffins have cooled down to room temperature, they were just cooked less than an hour ago. These store-bought ones were probably baked at least a week ago, if not longer. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna heat the griddle back up, add some butter onto it, and griddle these for a few minutes. Now we know that bread stales very quickly, especially in the refrigerator, so don't ever store your bread products in the refrigerator because they stale exponentially faster than they do at room temperature or in the freezer. And most of the time, these are transported overland in refrigerated trucks because otherwise they'll just bake again in the summertime. But reheating bread gelates the starch and brings it back to life. So we're gonna cook all three of these up and do a head-to-head -head taste test. And now, for the greater good, I am going to taste these crannies to find out which ones are the most delicious crannies. I'm gonna start with the classic Thomas and just plain griddle and butter. I'm not gonna do the jam or anything because that's really the purpose of this, is to carry jam. It tastes like an English muffin, which is basically not much of anything. It's dough, it's crunchy and good from the butter but it's fairly one note. All right, now I'm going to test the major national brand's fake sourdough muffin with the unusually large honeycombed crannies. Completely honestly, it has a lot less flavor than the Thomas muffin, which is kind of shocking considering they're marketing it as a sourdough product. There's absolutely no hint of sour at all to that and considerably less flavor than the Thomas muffin. Now, our homemade sourdough. Somehow it is crunchier and more moist at the exact same time than the other two bagels. But that is of course thanks to the high hydration recipe. Objectively, I think any human being would prefer the flavor of our homemade English muffins to the stuff that comes from the store. But we already knew that was gonna happen, right? I hope you folks have enjoyed this little jaunt through English muffin land today. Hopefully you learned a few things that you had absolutely no idea about previously, but you definitely learned how to make a delicious English muffin with only seven simple sourdough ingredients with practically no effort and only a couple of little rings. If you've enjoyed this video, please click the thumbs up button and the subscribe button. It helps me out more than you know. Thanks so much for watching everyone. I'm Ben Starr, the ultimate food geek. Have a great day.